Thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> thanks for asking me to talk today because we've got an interesting story that's spanned for about 12 years that has, um, uh, that has really brought ideas into clinical practice and uh, something which has actually caught on around the world. As a gastroenterologist, as a clinician, I like to find problems and then see if we can solve the problem. And the problem really was functional gastrointestinal symptoms. We're talking about bloating, abdominal pain, altered bowel habits, and a few others. And these symptoms really are, um, are all about the function of the gut, not about disease as such such as inflammation, cancer, and so on. And they occur chronically in people who we, we call functional gastrointestinal disorders. Of course, if you've got an acronym, it has to be important, FGID. Uh, and that occurs in about 15% of the community. So there'll be several people in this room who will have one of these. But also they occur in... Uh, in uh, association with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and celiac disease. And basically, these are about at least one third of the business of a gastroenterologist. However, our ability to treat it was always very poor, and it hardly ever got any attention in research or in, uh, in practice. The sorts of gastro, the functional gastrointestinal disorders I'm talking about, the most common that everyone knows about is irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, but there are also lots of other types of classifications, but they're all very similar in their pathophysiology. Now, the problem that I saw it being very interested in diet and interested in colonic epithelial biology and physiology is that there are no efficacious dietary therapies. But this was despite the fact that ingestion of food triggers the symptoms in patients in at least 60%, probably more like 80% of people, and that there's a huge community interest in diet to treat illness, as you would all be aware. And that in fact, changing the diet is what people do to deal with their, with their IBS and other functional gut symptoms. And the other thing is, that we know from a pathophysiological point of view, there are multiple mechanisms by which food induce symptoms. And this, I've put this up just not because I'm going to go through it, but just to show the immunologists that we can create just as complex a diagrams <laughs> as uh, they can. So how are we going to solve this problem? And, they, and first of all, you have to have a hypothesis. And hypotheses don't have to be complex. Our hypothesis was 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 5. And you'll see what that means in a moment. Basically, we know that there are short chain carbohydrates that are poorly absorbed, slowly absorbed, or not digested at all, and not absorbed in the small intestine. And all of these do things which distend the intestine via the biosmotic effects and or gas production. And it's stretching of the bowel wall that is one of the major stimuli that cause, uh, cause symptoms in the gut. And we knew that every one of these, fructose, lactose, fructans, galacto-oligosaccharides, and polyols, had all been shown to actually cause functional gut symptoms. However, when uh, lots of studies have been done, when you do something like stop lactose in the diet, lactose in, uh, in uh, many dairy products, that it doesn't really help the symptoms in people with IBS. It stops you getting symptoms after a, a milkshake by not having that milkshake, but it doesn't, didn't really have any impact. And we had the same sort of thing uh, with each of the other varieties. And so the simple theory was that we should consider all of these together and that if we can reduce all of them, we will get more bang for our buck and maybe we'll do something about the symptoms of IBS. And if you just look here, this, this diagram here shows when in the last century 
that it was described that lactose, fructose, polyols, fructans, galactol, and saccharide actually caused symptoms. And various diets had been, had been uh, devised, but none of them were in clinical practice apart from lactose-free diet in people who, uh, uh, who, pe people who got symptoms after uh, eating lactose. So this created a problem in that we had to have a term. We had to have a term for all these short chain, slowly absorbed or uh, indigestible carbohydrates because every time, if you give a lecture and, and describe them as that every time, you, most of you, about five minutes is gone in your lecture. So we had to create an acronym and the acronym was FODMAP because it was, a, it was what it, uh, it did was it enabled us to communicate about this better, but it also focused people's views upon the family, not upon the individual. It was met with howls of laughter and derision when we first had it, and they said, oh, very amusing. It's so amusing, this, uh, this study. And, uh, and, and they said, what an ugly name. Those were the things. And then we had the problem that, OK, you can use something, but how do you get it into the literature? Because if we want to do anything with this, you've got to get be able to publish it. And so what, uh, what I decided to do was publish a hypothesis paper in Crohn's disease where we called it the FODMAP hypothesis and we've not studied that ever since. But FODMAP got into the literature. <laughs> so FODMAPs, where are these found? Well, FODMAPs is, refers to fermentable oleosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols and it's present in multiple foods. The fructans, which are uh, chains of, of uh, uh, like fructooligosaccharides, are in onion family. The polyols you'll find in, uh, here is in cauliflower. The fructans are also in uh, wheat products and so on. Galactooligosaccharides, they're the things in legumes. So you all know the effect of baked beans. So then, if you're going to reduce these, you have to have a simple diet, you have to devise a diet, and the, the diet was very, very simple in its concept, in that we avoided all foods that were high in FODMAPs, replace foods that are low in FODMAPs in each group so you don't lose nutritional adequacy. You do this for a few weeks. If you get better, or sorry, if you don't get better, you stop it, which a lot of people actually don't do for reasons which we can't work out. But if you have efficacy, then you, then you need to reintroduce to a step down to according to tolerance. So this is a fairly standard dietary therapy for uh, intolerances. Now, one of the advantages of having highly talented uh, PhD students is that, is that they bring wonderful art work to the, uh, to the department. And this is uh, Carolyn Tuck, who was a great student. She only had one problem. She wasn't too good at perspective because here's the small intestine, here's the large intestine, and these are bacteria. <laughs> but to illustrate on how the first issue we had to do was to work out how these things, did they actually work as we said, that, as we thought they did? And so with food studies, we were able to show that oligosaccharides that they go through, they don't get digested at all, go into the large bowel. Lactose, if you don't have lactase, if you have a hypolactasia, will go into the large bowel. And polyols and fructose are uh, things that, uh, that are slowly absorbed down the small intestine, and some of it may get into the large intestine. But these are small molecules, and they bring water into the uh, small bowel, very nicely shown in MR studies. That water will go through to the large bowel. The, the carbohydrates in the large bowel are like McDonald's to, uh, to uh, uh, bacteria, and they ferment them. And from fermentation makes gas, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, methane. So basically, what's happening is the very simple concept that increased water delivery, increased gas production, distends the lumen. If you've got visceral hypersensitivity, that is that if you have an irritable bowel syndrome and your gut doesn't like this distension, you will get pain, bloating, and secondarily get changes in your bowel actions. 
So that's great. We've got the theory. All that was shown in, in studies uh, to be uh, correct. But how do we prove efficacy? And this is a major problem in dietary studies. We need randomised, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials to do this, just like you do to show a drug is any good. The difficulty with diets are in how do you design a placebo diet, how do you deliver a placebo diet without using the wrong body, the body uh, language. Collinearity, you, you change one thing, you'll change another thing which you didn't realise you changed. Blinding is quite difficult because people know about food or think they know about food. So the gold standard really for this is to provide all the food to people. And so to do that, you need an infrastructure, a suitable infrastructure, where you need a, a research chef to make them tasty. You need a kitchen, you need to be able to package it, you need mechanisms of delivery uh, of, the, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the food to people. And in fact, what we did, we developed all of these and with the, the abilities of our, uh, our combination of skills in our group, whether a dietetics, clinical trial design expertise, understanding of clinical settings, we were able to, uh, to take this on. And the other thing we learnt is you need to deal with the rigidity of journal editors and reviewers because, because what happens is that everyone, you know, talking about interleukin 37, no one knows about it. Everyone knows about food and everyone's an expert. So whenever you get in there with some dietary studies related to food, there are enormous biases come through from reviewers and editors. So this is always a big, big deal when you're trying to get new, even though they're not so new concepts out there. Now all the food was provided, and I can just show you some of the, uh, the foods that, uh, this is the sort of food people were given. It wasn't, wasn't rubbish, and, uh, and for those of you who are, uh, who uh, uh, watch the ABC, let the check out, this is the product versus the pack shot, these are the pack shots. <laughs> I'll explain that to you later, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then the major study, and we did quite a few different studies, but the major, the pivotal study was one where we fed 30 people with irritable bowel syndrome for uh, 21 days on one diet and 21 days on another diet. These people didn't have a clue what, what was FODMAPs and what was, uh, because it was in the early days. And then we measured what happened to their symptoms using a visual analog scale that went up to 100. And this is fairly typical of, uh, uh, of the, the, the severity of symptoms. And you can see there was a big difference between the typical Aussie FODMAP diet and the uh, low FODMAP diet and this was highly significant. We also found that 70% had a decrease in overall symptoms, which was about what we see in clinical practice using this diet. And fortunately, this is where we had the major breakthrough, was probably not only doing the study, but also getting our American colleagues to accept it, and they put it on the front cover of, the, of gastroenterology, which is the number one journal in the area, which actually gave it respectability. And there are now many randomised controlled trials across the world that have been done that have all shown that it is efficacious. So then we come to a third problem. This all depends upon knowing which foods are high in FODMAPs and which are low in FODMAPs. And this is critical to the diet. And there were very poor databases around, actually no databases around when we started. So we've had an ongoing program of methodological of a methodical measurement of uh, FODMAP content of foods. So what happens is that by using combination of HPL assays, we have got a huge uh, a database of foods. And this is the sort of thing you can see, just a few of the foods here. And we also have done lots of studies to, to look at the relevant uh, levels of what is high and what is low. So this is fine, having a good database. Of course, when you develop a database from a lot of work, you've got to protect that. You don't just give it out to everyone because then you've completely lost all of your work and all of your intellectual property. So the question is, how do we deliver information of our research directly to the end user? So how do we get this out there? And the answer was 
really via an app, a digital technology. And my children, who when, when I said we're, you, we're doing an app and I was invited to talk at a, at a meeting uh, where it was a digital meeting on digital medicine and uh, digital technology, they just thought it was hilarious that I was there talking about digital technology. But this was not my idea. This was, where's Jane? Is Jane here? No, well, Jane Muir's idea to do this and it was a fantastic idea. What the app did was we were able to classify foods according to low levels, moderate levels and high levels, and by, a, by a, a, a rating them by a traffic light system. And you can go down, you can go look here, fruit, you can get to cherries and cherries, then you find out which of the FODMAPs are there. We don't give the numbers out because the numbers are less meaningful. This is the meaningful way of doing it. And we also are now doing it with a lot of international food, foods from right around the world. And you can, you can uh, with this app, you can actually uh, filter out uh, which, which country you live in to get the answers. The other thing apps do, oh, just to say that app, it's been successful because it's the, it's the top medical app across the world. It's downloaded in over 120 countries and they're all the countries where it has been number one and most of them remains at number one. So it is a very, very popular, it's been very successful in getting this information out. The other thing about apps is that people feed back to you. And so we were able to get information about what's missing on the app. We could measure it in the lab, it takes about two weeks, and we can get the results back onto the, out on the app within a few weeks of that. So it's a, not only a way of getting information straight from the laboratory to the end user, but it's also a way of getting the end user involved in, in actually improving the results. So currently the status of low FODMAP diet is now used across the world. It's entering guidelines such as therapeutic guidelines, been in therapeutic guidelines in Australia for some time, but the, uh, the, the English NICE guidelines, the World Gastroenterology Organization and the American guidelines are being formulated now. Most importantly, it doesn't matter how many papers you publish, you need celebrity educators to help you. And, uh, and Dr. Oz, uh, Michael Mosley, uh, the two most recent people who have endorsed, endorsed it and, uh, and Michael Mosley's latest book, uh, The Clever Gut Diet, that's not the low FODMAP diet, but, uh, but he's, uh, he's, he's given us a good rap in it. So what I've tried to do was to talk about translational research in our, in, in what we've done. First of all, hypotheses don't need to be complex. I was always taught the simplest, uh, simplest hypotheses were the best. Secondly, there are very many different levels of translation. I spent uh, many, many, a uh, couple of decades working in laboratories, working in animals, working with human beings, looking at physiological and clinical observations about diet, what happens to food, how it affects cell biology. But we're able to translate that, and, and my colleague Jane Muir had been doing the same from a, 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 a dietetic and scientist point of view. But we were able to translate hypotheses based on, on these observations to potential clinical application. We've also then translated the potential to actual high level evidence by randomised controlled trials and other means. And more importantly, and I think something that, that I never knew I would be uh, involved in, is translating the evidence to actual change of paradigms of treatment across the world. And this is something which has been incredibly exciting to us all, because we all have great ideas, we think they're wonderful, but most of them don't go much further than your own uh, uh, a, a very small area. This is only possible because of the innovation and the actions, the hard work, the ideas of a multidisciplinary team with diverse expertise. We couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Jane couldn't have done it by herself. Everyone else involved couldn't have done it by themselves because it requires knowledge and ideas coming from dietetics, physiology, biochemistry, clinical trial design, gastroenterology. So that I think it's really important 
that if anything you learn, you get from today is that translation of good research does require multidisciplinary. I think you've heard this a few times today. And just to say that the teamwork, here's uh, many members of the team. When we, uh, we had a conference over at Prato, uh, and uh, where are we? Here's Jane, who uh, is the leader of the pack. They call her mother. Uh, I don't think they haven't said that, but they probably call me grandfather in the behind the, <laughs> behind the scenes. Thanks. <laughs>